Today on Spiritual Awakening Radio, readings from Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson. Authored by Julian Johnson in the 1920s, Path of the Masters has become a spiritual saint Mott classic book that remains popular to this day. It's a kind of theosophical presentation of saint Mott, if you will, and has been a very influential and even plagiarized book in some circles. Very influential on many in the West, as well as, of course, it represents the teachings of Samhain Singh, written down and presented by Julian Johnson in the East. Julian Johnson was an initiate of Hazur Baba Samhain Singh of the Radhaswami Satsang Bayas. Julian Johnson writes, when the chela, the student or spiritual seeker is ready, the guru, the master, appears. It is a common saying among occultists and is often repeated in the literature. For a quarter of a century, the writer kept trying to believe this statement, but he often wondered if it was literally true, or was it just an optimistic expression of those few who had succeeded in finding one. For a quarter of a century, he had believed in the existence of the guru, the master, the genuine Mahatma. God knows there was plenty of need for them. If they did not exist, there was, in the economy of human life, a decided deficiency. If one accepts the major premise of a supreme and benevolent creator whose fundamental nature is love, then he can scarcely believe that Creator would leave untold billions of his children to wander around like babies in a wilderness, unguided, unenlightened, and unprotected. If he sent us down into this world for some beneficent purpose, then he cannot fail to look after us and to see that his purposes are ultimately conserved. There simply must be masters. That is our first and root conviction. They are necessary to any rational order in this world. Without them there is chaos, only blind drifting and chance, nothing but hopes and vague uncertainties, groping speculations. Excepting the masters and their disciples, there is not a man or woman in all the world who has any certain knowledge concerning the most important problems of the soul or even of the existence of the soul itself. All the rest only believe, imagine, speculate, and preach. Only the masters know. The full story cannot be told. Having now had the inestimable privilege of living for over 16 months in close association with one of the greatest of these saints, the writer is most happy to offer this personal testimony to all who may be seeking the light. The major part and the most vital of all his experiences with the Master must remain untold. They belong in that category of individual experiences which can never be told to another. And if it could be told would serve no useful purpose. Only the most superficial, the least convincing of all his experiences the occult student may put into writing. Each student in search of a larger reality must travel the path for himself. The most that even a master himself can do at first is to point the way. If the soul of the reader is ready for the light, he will not fail to see the guidepost directing him on the way nor will he ever again pause until he rests at the master's holy feet. But if he is not ready, he must pass again under the wheel and wait for future ages to bring him to higher levels of consciousness. That's from the introduction by Julian P. Johnson from another book called With a Great Master in India which I thought would be very appropriate at the beginning since he's talking about his spiritual search and finding a living master. No longer out of the loop, but connected to a living teacher sitting at the feet of a living master. That's from the introduction to With a Great Master in India, Julian Johnson speaking of his time with Hazur Baba Sawan Singh. That book is now online. 
and I have provided a link to it. Feel free to request that link and you'll find it now at archive.org with a great master in India is online at archive.org as is Path of the Masters. At my Santmat e-library I have a whole section dedicated to all of the writings that are available at present of Julian P. Johnson. The Julian Johnson section of the Santmat Radhaswami e-library. I begin with this reading, Return to the Source, a reading from Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson. The world has never been without a living master. Beneath all the other impelling forces in the creation, spirituality is the primary cause. That and that alone is the driving force that always leaps up to join its source. In every living being, from tiny plant up to man, the spiritual flame of life is struggling upward and onward toward its source of being. And this process and this struggle must go on until the last speck of dust returns to the central fires of infinite being. The message of the Masters fills the world with hope, and at the same time it offers a rational foundation for such hope. It not only tells people what they should do, but it offers them a definite method of doing it. In the march of the ages, cycle after cycle, in every planet where human beings reside, the great masters are the light bearers of that world. Until the end of the ages, they will remain the friends and saviors of those who struggle toward the light. The divine spark in each one always struggling for freedom, striving hard against adverse currents, reaches out a feeble hand toward the Master. In great kindness the Master takes that hand, unclean though it may be. After that it may require years of patient hard work to build up the character, to strengthen the will, and throw off the evil passions, writes Julian Johnson. Before I continue, a little bit about Julian Johnson. This is courtesy of Wikipedia. Julian Johnson, born in 1873, passed on in 1939. He was an American surgeon and author of several books on Eastern spirituality. A native Kentuckian, he left his medical practice in California and traveled to Bayas, India in order to serve his guru, Baba Sawan Singh. From 1933 to 1939, Johnson lived with his master and devoted much of his time to writing about his master and his experiences on the path. Johnson grew up in a staunch Christian family, became a Baptist minister at the age 17, graduated with a Bachelor of Divinity, and received an appointment as a missionary to India at age 22. Johnson claimed that experiences during his three-year stay in India rendered him surprised by the deep understanding possessed by Indians. He sought to convert and urged him towards further spiritual study. Back in the USA, he earned a master's degree in theology, resigned his 17-year Baptist ministership, and earned an an M.D., a medical degree from the State University of Iowa, he served as an assistant surgeon in the United States Navy during World War I and later went into private practice. He also owned and flew his own airplanes. Over the years, he took to studies of various religions and philosophical teachings. His spiritual explorations culminated when he visited an old friend who was a disciple of Baba Sawan Singh. Convinced that he had found his path, Johnson requested initiation, which was arranged for by Dr. Harold Brock and performed on March 21, 1931. After a year, Johnson left once more for India. Dr. Johnson was the first American to live at Dera Baba Jamal Singh, the colony in Bayas. 
where he became busy with study, writing, medical work, meditation, and traveling with Sawan Singh. He authored With a Great Master in India in 1934, the first book on Sir Shabd Yoga by a Westerner, and his masterwork, Path of the Masters. While living in India, Johnson applied himself wholeheartedly to his spiritual practice, and after seven years of constant personal guidance and attention from the Master, he was requested by him to document his knowledge, to communicate this path of God-realization to others. This book, The Path of the Masters, was the result. Published in France in 1939 and the U.S. in 1951, Path of the Masters was written specifically for the Western seeker of God by a person of the West who had lived a rich and varied life before coming into contact with the mystic teachings of the East. It is the first modern book to record in English the esoteric teachings of the Eastern Masters with such clarity and comprehensiveness. It has run through 14 editions and has been translated into 30 languages. It is considered a classic in Oriental mysticism. That's from Preface to Path of the Masters, made use of by Wikipedia. Just my take on Path of the Masters, it's not a perfect book. There have been a few edits by the editors, by the publishers over the years. Uh, it's, after all, written by a Kentuckian in the 1920s. Uh, Master Kripal Singh said Julian Johnson had a bit of a missionary spirit and would have put certain things pertaining to the world religions section of the book a bit more diplomatically. But overall, it's a masterpiece. Johnson was an incredibly eloquent writer. I've uh, retrieved some other material by Johnson and published a document which I now have at my Saint Mont e library featuring certain letters of Julian Johnson to his eventual wife, Elizabeth Bruce, and to the guru of the Dial Bog colony. And what a writer, what an eloquent person uh, he was. So a very talented person. Uh, though presenting the teachings of Saint Maud in a somewhat theosophical sort of way that speaks to his age back there in the early half of the 20th century. But that all comes together and creates a very interesting book that communicates some very important teachings from the masters of India. Now we begin with some readings from Path of the Masters. Julian Johnson, there are three great links in the golden chain of salvation. The living Satguru, the audible life stream, and spiritual liberation. The master breaks no law of man, but supports all good governments. His life and teachings are universal. He belongs to no race or time, but to all nations and all times. He is a citizen of the world, more correctly speaking, having come down here to bring light. He is a friendly visitor to this world. The master lives in the world, though he is not of it. He enters the stream of human life to help others, yet he himself stands aloof from the waves of human passion. He has attained all virtues and does not contain any human faults. The Master loves everyone regardless of character. He gives love to all and seeks to serve all. He is always master of the situation, no matter where he is placed. He is never disturbed by the whirlwinds of passion surging about him. Serenely he watches the mad show and seeks to guide others in the ways of sanity. The Master of the Inner Realms this world is a theater of intellect, at least this is one of the fields of operation. It is the play of the mind. In this field, science has made many a conquest and will doubtlessly make many more. 
but there is a vast field far above and beyond the play of the mind, where the developed spirit alone may enter. It is into this higher region of the spirit where the master goes, and it is there where his real achievements are made. Entering there by methods well known to him, he finds that this earthly world is nothing more than the mud slit of nature's vast and complicated structure. Above and beyond this world of shadow and pain lie innumerable worlds of intense light. They are real worlds full of beauty, color, rhythm, and joy. Escaping for the time being the limitations of the body, the master travels in those higher worlds in full consciousness, and then he returns to report what he has seen and heard and otherwise experiences. He knows, among other things, that death is only an appearance, an illusion. When a man leaves his physical body at the time of what we call death, he simply steps out into other and higher worlds. He takes with him a finer body, which he now uses unconsciously, and on that higher plane he uses the finer one just as he uses the physical body here. Going about wherever he pleases, clothed in a godlike vesture of light, wisdom, power, and beauty, the master explores the higher regions wholly unknown to the common earth man. This is but a glimpse of the real master. To understand a real master fully, one must oneself become a master. The time limit of the master's work. There is one very important consideration regarding the work of all masters, which appears never to have been understood by Western people. This is the fact that their work is time limited. This means that each master has a definite period in which to do his work. When that time has expired, his work on earth is finished. That limited period is during the life of their physical bodies. That being the case, logically they cannot work among men without their body. When that body passes, or they pass out of it, their work on earth is finished. When a master's work on earth is finished, he leaves his body and turns over his work to his successor. This is an arrangement ordained by the Supreme Lord himself. God's method of working among men is by and through living men. Even if the ancient master, present in spirit as claimed by so many, were ready to assist us, it is impossible for us to receive his help. If we must depend upon feelings and impressions, we are mixed up with so many feelings and impressions that it is quite impossible for us to distinguish between them so as to know which are from God or the old master and which are from our own subconscious minds. If you insist that your dead master is not dead, then I will cheerfully agree with you. He is not dead, but he has left this theater of action. He is no longer in touch with humanity. His present work is elsewhere. There is no doubt that departed masters have certain work to do in connection with their disciples, but not in other worldly matters. The same God power, different human poles. So many people find it difficult to believe in masters. One of the strangest freaks of the human mind is the tendency to discredit all modern things, especially those relating to religions, and to give the emphasis and glory to that which is ancient. It cannot accept that which is right before its own eyes, but it will swallow instantly what was written in a book two or three thousand years ago. It cannot believe in a living master, but it finds no difficulty at all in accepting the story of some master who lived in the dim and distant past. That men should ever have developed the strange notion that all mastership and all revelation of truth should belong to past ages is one of the anomalies of history, and it is one of the most unfortunate. If past ages could produce a master, a Christ, a Buddha, why may we not look for one now? Julian P. Johnson, Path of the Masters. And that paragraph reminds me a lot of saying 52 of the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, his disciples said to him, 24 prophets spoke in Israel and they all spoke of you. He said to them, 
You have abandoned the living one before your eyes and have spoken about the dead." Unquote. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Unquote. You have abandoned the living one before your eyes and spoken about the dead, said Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, saying 52. So do not be swept away by the main current. Rather, you who can must avail of yourselves a countercurrent. Take to the haven of safety, put in there, and look for a leader to show you the way to the doors of Gnosis, where there is bright light, pure from darkness, where no one is intoxicated, but all are sober, fixing their eyes on that being who wills to be seen, but mentally with the eye of the soul. For that being cannot be heard or told of or seen by eyes or fleshly eyes, only by the mind's eye, the eye of the soul. That's a quote from the Corpus Hermeticum, a short section called The Greatest Human Evil is Unacquaintance with God, talking about searching for a living teacher, a living guide that will reveal to us, will be a catalyst to us and direct us towards our own experience of inner hearing and inner seeing. As it says in the Gospel of Thomas, look for the living one while you are alive so that you will not die and then seek to see him and you will not be able to see him. As Rumi once said, join the community of saints and know the delight of your soul. More readings from Path of the Masters by Julian Johnson. After this break, you're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned. Today on Spiritual Awakening Radio, Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson, both the book and the path that Julian Johnson was describing in his great spiritual classic before the break. We were talking about the section where he delves into the need for living teachers, that looking to past masters is not enough. And in fact, there is a great mind trap, a great danger of a kind of sock puppet mentality where you read old scriptures and see what you want to see and ignore the rest, a kind of redacted sock puppet master that tells you what you want to hear and anything that you are in need of hearing that you don't want to hear or cultural blind spots you know all of that remains blind r remains undealt with for instance in the new testament the apostle paul wrote various letters or scriptures if you will to various congregations including the corinthians but he also said he was going to visit them in person to straighten some things out and so without that living teacher without that actual connection to a real community that straightening out, that corrective action, never happens, never takes place. Kirpal Singh wrote, Right thoughts follow right understanding. Right understanding comes from whom? From those who have got the right understanding. Those who see nature working in its true perspective. And such like people were very few in the past, and even now. But the world is not without them. Kirpal Singh said, there are always masters in the world. I wrote a poem about this whole subject of spiritual seeking and sifting through the books and libraries uh, and spiritual paths of the world, trying to find the truth, trying to find answers, trying to find God. An enormous cosmos is out there, many voices trying to convince us of the merits of their path and the merits of their destination. Many yogas, many meditations, many breaths, many lives, many lights in dark matter skies, below yet more dark skies. Many caught in dreams of separation, many asleep who have forgotten who they were before time began, who they still are, truth be told. 
A discarnate, channeled spirit is not a worthy guide, having never been in the human form and may not even have much love for humanity. Biological infestation are we. A disincarnate spirit is impossible to know. One has only words to go by. Many avatars attempt to vacuum up souls with words, taking them to various realms of astral, causal, mental, or etheric. Misdirected perception is another name for the work of an archon, a demiurge, a Kal Naringen, a collector of the energy of souls. There's a religion for every chakra, and there is a religion for every realm of creation. Materialists proclaim, this is all there is. An astral guide will never guide one beyond the astral. Astrals take souls to that realm, saying, you've made it. Worshippers of universal mind believe that they have created the highest reality. But it is no longer a prison when we are free to leave, moving beyond the soul-neglected state of God-denial and all the spiritual poverty thereof, the Atman project, with a living teacher who has a body, not a holy book. One has the potential opportunity to evaluate if they are genuine or fraud or monster or the embodiment of love and compassion from above, a light appearing to us in the darkness of contemplation. Enoch had a body. Buddha had a body. Christ had a body. Valentinus had a body. Shams of Tabriz had a body. Rumi had a body. Hafez had a body. Nanak had a body. Kabir had a body. Dharamdas had a body. Gobind Singh had a body. Paltu Saab had a body. Darya Sahib had a body. Tulsi Sahib had a body. Shiv Dayal had a body. Living ones, not held captive for centuries long gone by, also have bodies today, here, now, in the living present. Somewhere close by, though perhaps unseen, unknown, there is a path about you, about me, the path of the soul, the pearl, and the lord of all souls, the ocean of love. One asleep awakens nobody. Master souls incarnate into the human form not because of karmic debt and attachment, but out of compassion to summon us to awakening. They ask, do you remember? They show us a passage by which we may find our way back, riding the holy stream of light sound, the audible life stream, the Tao or Logos that was with us in the beginning before time came to be. As Kabir says, you have slept for millions of years. This morning, will you not wake? Astral travelers stay astrally confined. Soul travelers passing through inner regions ascend through a long tunnel with the grace of the audible life stream, the positive power. Beyond the material plane, beyond the astral, beyond the causal akashic, beyond the mental plane, is the timeless realm, God beyond God. This is the place of life. This is the point of origin. We never left home, only our attention. We are still. Our true identity remains. Soul. This is the path of remembrance. When the drop returns to oneness with the ocean, all form will disappear into formlessness. We become what we focus our soul attention upon. If we should happen to dwell upon the absolute, If you meditate upon the Absolute, you become that with a capital T. The Absolute, and that's the definition of Surat Shab Yoga. The attention faculty of the soul being placed upon the divine light and sound that flows back into the ocean of love and all consciousness, which is a way of transitioning from duality and the various levels of illusion back to the ultimate reality, the oneness called God. After the break, we'll delve back into the book Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson on the meditation practice of Sant Mat, known as Surit Shab Yoga, the yoga of the audible life stream. The 
path of the masters today on spiritual awakening radio it's the name of a book by julian p johnson it's also the name of a spiritual movement in modern times based in india known as the path of the masters sometimes also called sant mat or radha swami those who practice surat shab yoga or meditation upon the divine light and sound of god it has affinities with earlier schools of mysticism and spirituality such as gnosticism and sufism but these days is based in india but the reality is the path of the masters is within all living beings the divine light and sound are like a river that flows back into the ocean of god and this is the real path of the masters Julian P Johnson The audible life stream is the cardinal central fact in the science of the masters it is the keystone of the arch it is the cornerstone of the structure it is the structure itself and it is the path of the masters one might say that the path and the life stream constitute the path of the masters The great spiritual current is not only the central fact in the science of the masters but it is the supreme fact and factor of the entire universe. It is the essence and the life of all things. It is perhaps less known than any other important fact of nature and yet it is the one determining factor of all nature. This great truth or fact is significantly spoken of in the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made Here it is definitely stated that something which is called word is identical with God the creator The statement is an important announcement of the stupendous fact of the audible life stream It is this divine current wave or stream going forth from God himself and flowing throughout the universe. It is not only an emanation from God, but it is God himself. When any man speaks in this world, he simply sets in motion atmospheric vibrations. But when God speaks, he not only sets in motion etheric vibrations, but he himself moves in and through those vibrations. In truth, it is God himself that vibrates all through infinite space. God is not static, latent. He is superlatively dynamic. When he speaks, everything in existence vibrates, and that is the sound, the shabd, and it can be heard by the inner ear which has been trained to hear it. It is the divine energy in process of manifestation which is the holy shabd. It is the only way in which the supreme one can be seen or heard this mighty luminous musical wave creating and enchanting. Now this great fact of nature so little known to either ancient or modern thought is the vital substance of the science of the masters. It is the one thing which distinguishes Sant Mat from all other sciences and systems. It is the very foundation of the masters system of yoga. It is the key to all their success in unfolding their spiritual powers and controlling their minds. Stated in the simplest words we can employ, the audible life stream is the supreme creator himself vibrating through space. It is the wave of spiritual life going forth from the creator to every living thing in the universe. By that current he has created all things and by it he sustains them. In this they all live and move. and have their being and by that same current they will ultimately return to their source of being now try to get a picture of that luminous reality the grand orchestra of the universe its heavenly strains are not only filling all interstellar space but they are ringing with far more enchanting music through all the higher worlds beyond the utmost bounds of the physical The higher we go the more enchanting the music in those higher worlds the music is less mixed with matter and so it is not dulled 
After passing the third region on the path of the masters, this sublime chorus becomes so overwhelmingly attractive that the soul grows impatient to go on up. It is absorbed in it. It lives in it day and night. It is its life, its joy, its spiritual food. There is not a cubic millimeter of space in existence which is not filled with this music. Sweeter and sweeter, its heavenly strains vibrate through every living being, great or small, from world to world, from universe to universe. Its life-giving melodies may not be consciously heard by those who are not trained to catch them. But there is not a living being in all creation which does not derive its life from this current. All joy that has ever thrilled a living soul has come out of this divine harmonic. How great is this luminous reality! This creative current, filling all space, may be likened to the electromagnetic waves of the radio. The receiving set is the human body, more accurately the astral body within the physical. The receiving set, standing on your table, simply has to be tuned in in order to receive the music. Each individual man or woman is a receiving set. As soon as it is tuned by the master, he is ready to receive the pure white music spoken of by Kabir. It then remains only to keep the instrument in proper order to go on enjoying this melodious bani. Of course, but few get the music at once after their initiation. It takes a little time to develop the inner hearing. The entire body, and more particularly the mind and astral body, must be cleaned and purified and then attuned to the higher vibrations. After that, the music comes clearly. When one begins to hear it, he is filled with a great joy, for there is nothing in the world to be compared with it. From the sacred hour when the student hears this music, he is never again alone or lonely. He may wander far from home or friends, but he is never lonely. In a true sense, he enjoys the companionship of God himself. The Supreme One is always present with him, playing for his delight the grandest chorus of the universe. Its sweet tones are calling him, tenderly calling him back home. And he longs to be on the way. Michio Kaku a very famous scientist these days says, quote, The mind of God, we believe, is cosmic music. The music of strings resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. More on Surit Shabd Yoga, meditation upon the inner light and sound of God. After this break, you're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. The Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. John chapter 1 At the same time the Gospel of John was circulating, a spiritual teacher in Alexandria, Egypt, by the name of Philo, was also using that term Logos and describing it as the Word and the source of creation. In the book, The Music of the Spheres, he writes, The divine Logos is the helmsman and governor of the universe. The everlasting Logos of the eternal God is the very sure and staunch prop of the whole. But the shadow of God is his word, or Logos, which he used like an instrument when he was making the world. And this shadow and, as it were, model is the archetype of other things. Heaven is ever making music, producing in accordance with its celestial motions the perfect harmony. To such strains it is said Moses was listening when having become disembodied for forty days and as many nights he touched neither bread nor water at all. Philo of Alexandria in The Music of the Spheres 
It says in the Acts of John, another book of the John community, What else is Christ but the sound of God? Julian P. Johnson, Path of the Masters, a section called Surat Shab Yoga, referring to the meditation of the inner light and sound of God. The very first step on approaching this path is to get initiation from a living master, a genuine Satguru. This point we have so often emphasized, but it cannot be overstressed. It is absolutely necessary. Without initiation, one may as well stop before he begins. He will get nowhere on the path. Now, supposing that he has received initiation, he will sit in a comfortable position, as he may select. The main point is that he keep his mind on the center in his head. His attention is then fixed upon a point inside of his head called Tishra Til, meaning the third eye. This is between the eyes and on a level with the eyebrows. The attention is to be held at this point continuously and without wavering. Perfect concentration at this center is the objective. The mind must be held still at this point. Remember that the mind and spirit are scattered all over one's body, but then they must now be gathered and concentrated at this one point in the head. To make this concentration perfect is the first great task to engage the attention and effort of the devotee. Compared with that, nothing else in the world is to be considered of any importance at all. Entering the other side. When every ray of attention is inside, concentrated at the proper center with no wavering thought lingering outside, then the student is in a position to get results. He will at first experience flashes of light or hear sounds, perhaps both. But no matter what he sees or hears, he should not allow his mind to wander from the center. When this concentration has reached its maximum within the ability of the individual, the soul has sufficient force to penetrate the tenth door. That is an opening in the subtle body, near the middle of the forehead. At first one may look out through this door, but by and by he goes through it and leaves the body completely. He then steps out into a new world which he never saw before. This new world will probably be some subplane of the astral zone. It is a new dimension to us. The Radiant Form of the Master At a point between the sun worlds and the moon worlds and the pure astral zone, the disciple of the Master enters the astral. At that place, something happens which changes the whole course of his life and also his method of procedure from that point on. It is the meeting with his own master in his radiant form. This is the master's light form. It is the master, his own master, appearing just as he does in physical life, except that his body is now much more beautiful and full of light, brilliantly illuminated. The radiant master then and there receives his disciple with much love to the great joy of the disciple. From that moment on, the two are never separated throughout the journey to still higher regions. Of course, this form is always with the disciple from the moment of his initiation, but the disciple cannot see him. But from here on, the disciple can see the master on the inner planes as well as the outer. At this time, another new feature enters the journey of the student. Up to now, he has been doing Simran, the repetition of the holy names, and that has given him fair concentration. But from now on, he will discontinue the Simran. He will not need it. Just pausing here, this is referring to this particular stage of the meditation, not a permanent discarding of Simran in meditation, just at this particular point of the meditation. Julian Johnson. He now has the presence of the master whom he may behold constantly. This is called Dion. This sight inspires much love and adoration. It is the most perfect Dion, and it is more effective than Simran for concentration. 
At this point, something else of great importance happens. You will contact the audible life stream perfectly and consciously, and its music will begin to work changes in you. You get a little of it before this point, but here you get it more perfectly. Here it begins to faintly enchant you and to pull you up with increasing attraction and power. You will find yourself listening to it with rapt attention and deep delight, completely absorbed in it. You will never wish to leave it or miss a single note of its marvelous strains. As Hazur Baba Sawan Singh once said, the sweet melody of the music of the spheres is endlessly playing within us. Thanks for joining me today on Spiritual Awakening Radio, exploring the path of the masters, a great Sant Mott textbook and spiritual classic by Julian P. Johnson. This book you can read for free online. I have in my Sant Mott e-library a section dedicated to various books of Julian P. Johnson, including Path of the Masters. Send me an email or text me. I can send you links to Path of the Masters and other books. Also, The Yoga of Sound in the World Religions. I was sharing with you a quote from Philo of Alexandria and uh, the Acts of John. And I have many other passages from the world scriptures on sound as well. Send me an email. I'll be happy to send you links to Path of the Masters and these other things. My email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. James at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Or text me at this number, 508-603-9381. Just text me if you're in North America. Use email if you're overseas because the... Google voicemail doesn't quite work with Germany or some of the other countries overseas. So email always works no matter where you are. James at spiritualawakeningradio.com. See you next week at the same time for another edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. Mm -hmm.